Uh, We're very glad to have our very own Jens talking to, to us about stability result for symmetric jump processes and metric measure spaces with atoms. Cool, thanks everyone for coming. Um, yeah, it is indeed stability results for symmetric jump processes on metric measure spaces with atoms. More specifically, the jump processes are um, like Markov processes with continuous time. And the stability results are showing that certain heat kernel estimates um, are stable under bounded perturbations of the jumping measure. And also a parabolic Harnack inequality, which I'll define later, is also stable under similar bounded perturbations of the jumping measure, but I'll get into the details of that as we go. So yeah, I guess let's start with just the setting. Um, and yeah, it seem to, yeah, there we go. So basically our setting is just any metric measure space, M is an underlying set, D is a metric on it, and mu is a measure uh, with a few more assumptions that I'll get into. But um, we also have a jump process XT on this which has continuous times, but it like takes jumps at certain rates. So like it has holding times kind of, or um, if the uh, elements of it are like measure zero, it might have like infinitely often, like infinitely many jumps per interval. Um, but the motivating example for the type of results that I came up with, um, just think of it as like a lattice or even Z1. Um, with the regular Euclidean metric. So like the distance between three and five is two or something and just the counting measure. Um, and let XT be the continuous time Markov chain on this where the transition probabilities, so jumps occur at, at say rate one or some constant rate. Um, and given that a jump occurs, the destination has distribution proportional to like the distance from the point where it's currently at to the negative two. Um, so uh, just to show kind of what this might look like, here's an example of this process, but imagine like each of these things were held for like um, an exponential amount of time. So we started at the origin, then took a small jump, a somewhat big jump, a couple of small jumps to the left. It all happened to be to the left till now, then another big jump, then a jump of two. Um, but basically like the type of processes that are relevant for this paper are kind of like uh, this sort of thing where like most of the, like the smaller jumps occur more often, but there's definitely like a lot of big jumps that occur. So it's not like a diffusion or a nearest neighbor random walk at all. Um, and like any point is accessible from any other point in most of the things that we'll consider. Um, so let's just talk about what some of the basic assumptions about this uh, process are. So assume that the metric space MD is separable and locally compact and assume that mu is a non-negative radon measure with full support. So radon measure just means like it's on the Borel sigma field and it's like regular and all the, and like finite on compact sets and that sort of thing. But like most of the uh, measures that one would probably come up with like in their mind would be uh, following these assumptions. Um, and also um, assume that the whole space has size infinity, which is kind of like a technical thing that'll come into play later, but um, a lot of this will probably still be like probably could be extended to finite spaces if you like cleverly modified a few things here and there. Um, so given such a jump process, uh, uh, the way to like it can be kind of encoded by a regular Dirichlet form E, um, which has a jump kernel J or a jump measure jumping measure J here. Um, for like, if I had seen this talk when I was like beginning my master's, I probably wouldn't really know what a regular Dirichlet form it was yet. So I hope that people who aren't familiar with this don't just kind of like get lost here. Think of the regular Dirichlet form as just kind of encoding what the jump transition probabilities are, because that's where the J, D, X, D, Y comes into play. Um, and the way that it encodes that um, is that like, uh, if this uh, radon Nicodem derivative exists, it tells you the rate of jumps from X into the set A. Um, yeah, and also just as like a vocabulary term, we refer to the uh, measure on M times M minus the diagonal as the jumping measure. And it tells us like how fast jumps occur from X to Y kind of. Um, okay, so just another kind of technical definition to get out of the way before we go into what the results say. Um, we're gonna consider a fixed function phi 
uh, from the non-negative reals to the non-negative reals. Um, and we say that it's of regular growth. If it's increasing, if it maps zero to zero, if it's continuous, it maps one to one. Um, and it has some constants that basically show it has to grow like at most at like some kind of polynomial-ish rate and at least at some kind of growing polynomial-ish rate. So think of this as like phi of r equals r or phi of r equals r squared or that sort of thing. Or it could be like r squared log one plus r or something. Um, but from, from this point on, let's just fix a function phi. Um, like uh, like in, the, it's in the motivating example that we did here, uh, phi would, would be r, but I'll explain why soon. Um, so think of it as like r or something. Um, oops. So yeah, uh, so we talked about the jumping measure before. That was the j dx dy that occurs in the Dirac waveform. Um, but we say that E admits a jump kernel. Um, basically, if that uh, radical Nicodem derivative that I showed earlier exists, and there is a function j of x, y, that's like a symmetric function on the space such that j dx dy is given by j x y times like mu of dx mu of dy. Um, and uh, so we're kind of abusing notation here. The jumping measure and jumping kernel are not quite the same thing, but they're quite related because one of them is just kind of like the kernel of the other one. Um, and then, so now we get to the first of many conditions on this process that we'll define. Um, we say that condition J phi, which depends on the function of regular growth phi that we talked about earlier, holds. Um, if first of all, a jump kernel exists and also the jump kernel is um, like multiplicatively comparable to one over, so like the jump kernel at x, y is comparable to one over the volume of the ball centered at uh, x with radius d, x, y, um, all that times phi of d of x, y. Um, and that's why in the motivating example where the transition uh, probabilities are proportional to x minus y to the negative two, in that example, um, oh, sorry, Omer? And V is the volume of the ball? I'm right, sorry, yeah. Uh, oh, you're right, I yeah. I, I don't think I had actually defined that, but you're right. Uh, v of XR is the ball centered at X with radius R, thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically in the, so in the motivating example, we would have um, V of X DX Y would be proportional to the magnitude of X minus Y because it's basically two times that, right? Because there's like, there's like that many to the right and that many to the left of x. And then phi of dxy would just be dxy. So um, j would be proportional to x minus y squared. And j is what the um, transition probabilities are proportional to in this case, because it's the, the counting measure is the underlying measure. Um, so once again, this condition is called j phi or j sub phi. But um, sometimes we'll only care about this upper bound and this lower bound, and we'll refer to those as j phi greater than and j phi less than. Um, yeah. Um, so now there's also another kernel that may or may not exist is the heat kernel. Um, basically, if all of these all of these conditions that I'll list in a second are satisfied, we say a heat kernel exists, and basically it, it's that it tells you kind of where the probability mass is after you start from x. Um, and run the process for uh, for t amount of time. And remember, it's a Markovian process, so uh, like it has the same rules at all times. But p t x y is basically the density of like x t if you started at x and run it for time t. Um, but it it has to be symmetric, and it has to follow the Chapman Kolmogorov equations. And basically, um, like many versions of this that that agree to almost everywhere will exist. But um, by imposing the symmetric and chapman kolmogorov conditions, you can make it unique is the point. Um, so, but once again, a heat kernel may or may not exist, but we'll talk about like ways to estimate the heat kernel when it exists. Um, so another condition, we say that HK phi or the heat kernel estimates condition holds if the heat kernel is multiplicatively comparable to this term here where it's one over the volume of the ball with radius uh, phi inverse of t, the minimum of that and t over the volume of the ball that goes through, that like includes like up to y times 
phi of the distance. Um, and a way to think about this thing is that this term here corresponds to like a big jump happening to occur early on in the process, right? So if you imagine y is far away from x um, and t is small, the probability that this thing jumps up to, like immediately jumps up to y is kind of gonna be proportional to t over this thing because this thing is just like j of x, y, um, assuming that the process satisfies j phi. Um, and this term kind of tells you that like, assuming there hasn't been some jump like that, it's kind of like close to uh, like somewhat well mixed on the ball of radius phi inverse of t. Um, yeah. Uh, so like hk phi and j phi will kind of be connected, uh, like they will be positively correlated with each other as we'll see later on. We'll show that hk phi is equivalent in under some basic assumptions to j phi plus a few things. Um, and another condition, PHI sub phi is the parabolic Harnack inequality, which the exact definition of is kind of complicated and I don't really wanna get into like exactly what all these cylinders are, but basically it's kind of something that uh, says that like all functions that satisfy the heat equation where this uh, Laplacian symbol thing here is the generator of the jump process satisfy this harnack -ish inequality which is kind of like based on stuff that came from parabolic PDEs on uh, like RD. Um, yeah. Um, but basically we're gonna show that HK phi and PHI sub phi, these two conditions are stable if you slightly modify the jump kernel by something that's like multiplicatively comparable to what we currently have. So that's what we call a bounded perturbation. Um, so a jumping measure J prime is said to be a bounded perturbation of J uh, if basically it's multiplicatively comparable. Like there exists constants big C and little c positive such that no matter what like X, Y or no matter what set A you give it, um, the ratio between J of A and J prime of A isn't too big and isn't too small. Um, so an easy, like, a, like a, one thing that one might think of for like why we would be interested in a result like this is imagine what if like J is like some very nice jump kernel that's well understood. And J prime is some complicated one where there's maybe like a lot of terms involved, but you can show that it's like multiplicatively comparable to J. Then we can just use the result for J and that'll tell us that if HK phi holds on one, then it holds on the other. And if PHI sub phi holds on one, then it holds on the other. Um, so yeah, we say that a condition cond, so think of cond as being like HK or PHI phi, um, uh, which depends on the whole, on not only the metric measure space, but also the Dewey clay form and thus the jump process on it. We say that that cond is stable under bounded perturbations. If whenever J prime is a bounded perturbation of J um, and E prime is defined by replacing the jumping measure J with J prime, we have that cond holding for one implies cond holding for the other and vice versa. So yeah, once again, we're gonna show that HK phi and PHI are both stable under bounded perturbations of the jumping measure. Um, and for now on, I'm just gonna say the word stable instead of all of that, but this is what I mean by stable. Um, so yeah, so one thing to mention is that clearly J phi is stable because if you change it by a certain amount, that's exactly what J phi says, like it'll still hold. Um, right, so yeah, the purpose of this research is to show that under minimal assumptions about the volume growth in the metric measure space, the conditions HK phi and PHI are stable under bounded perturbations of the jumping measure. Um, so let's get to uh, what those assumptions about the uh, volume growth are. So um, as Omer pointed out, uh, and I forgot to write down in my earlier slides, uh, we're letting V of XR denote the volume of the ball of center X and radius R. So we say that the volume doubling property or VD holds if there's a constant C such that the uh, ball of radius 2R centered at X is at most c times, has at most c times the volume of the ball of radius r centered at x. Um, and, the, and if this holds for all x's and all r's in r space. Um, and there's a different way to write down vd, where instead of just comparing r and 2r, you compare little r to any big r bigger than it. Um, and you can show that these two are equivalent. But basically, it's that if you replace it, if you replace little r with some big r, you get at most uh, some other constant times. Um, the ratio between the radii to some exponent times your initial volume. Um, and these constants may not be the same. 
And also, uh, there's nothing special about the constant two here. If you replaced it with any L greater than one, you, you could also get something like that, except the C here would depend on your L. Um, so, but the, like, to conceptually think of what it means to have volume doubling, it basically means that if you like increase the volume of the ball by a certain constant, um, you at most uh, increase the volume by a certain constant. I think I said volume when I meant radius. If you increase the radius by a certain constant, you at most increase the volume by another certain constant. So reverse volume doubling says the opposite of that. It says that um, if you like increase the volume by, or, sorry, if you increase the radius of the ball by some constant, then you at least increase the volume by some other constant greater than one. So basically there exists some little c greater than one such that if you increase the volume, if you increase the radius by a factor of L, you increase the volume by at least a factor of little c. Um, yeah, so they seem to kind of say opposite things, but it turns out that they're um, like, uh, VD implies RVD under some uh, conditions like uniform perfectness, but I'll get to that later. Um, and also RVD has another expression of this form, but in this case, uh, it might not hold for all L. Like it, there just has to be like some sufficiently large L for which it holds, and then it'll hold for all bigger L, but it might not hold for smaller L. But in order for the condition RVD to hold, there just has to be some L for which this works. Um, I guess I've kind of defined a lot of things. So are there any questions uh, at this point? Um, if like someone missed something, I can go back to something. I don't like, there's a lot of terminology that kind of has to be defined. So I don't want to just like bombard everyone with that and go too fast. Um, yeah. Um, uh, hi Jens. So could you explain a bit what parabolic stands for, for the parabolic Harnack inequality? Like, oh, yeah. um, so like, uh, it's basically like from parabolic partial differential equations is what this arose from. And um, so like the, the elliptic Harnack inequality is another Harnack inequality and it holds for like functions that solve the, um, like the, uh, sorry, the, I'm forgetting the name of the differential equation, but it's like um, harmonic functions. But the parabolic version is for caloric functions which basically solve, uh, I'll go back to the definition of that. Um, yeah, it's basically this differential equation where this Laplacian thing is the generator of the jump process. And this is the time derivative of u. Thank you. Yeah, um, sorry for not going into the details of that, but um, yeah. Um, oops, uh, yeah, okay. So cool. So we've done, we've, we've, yeah, we've done the reverse volume doubling. Cool. So let's just talk a little bit about the history of uh, results of this flavor. So the first kind of things like this were in the early nineties when Grigorian and Salafkos independently showed that in the very narrow setting of diffusions on, uh, on Riemannian or so geodesically complete smooth Riemannian manifolds uh, with walk dimension two, so walk dimension basically means, walk dimension two basically means that like after time t, you've moved a distance that's like um, some factor of root t. Um, so like Brownian motion would be an example of a diffusion with walk dimension two. Um, that the parabolic Harnack inequality is equivalent to some Gaussian heat kernel estimates. So the heat kernel estimates that, we're, that we defined are not Gaussian, but, they're, but that's because we're doing a jump process instead of a diffusion. Um, but these are both in turn equivalent to volume doubling plus a weak Poincaré inequality. Um, and then, so a few years later, Sturm extended this to symmetric diffusions on general metric measure spaces, but this is still diffusion. So it's still very a very different setting than what we have. And it's still with Gaussian heat kernel estimates because those kind of correspond to diffusions more. Um, and then Del Knott extended it to nearest neighbor random walks on graphs. Um, which is kind of like the diffusion analog for graphs, right? Because it's still everything's just going to like the nearest local place instead of just like taking long jumps of some polynomial transition probability, like what we're going to consider. Um, and then there have been a few more generalizations, most of them involving uh, our very own Martin Barlow in some capacity, um, which allow the walk dimension to exceed two. So like fractals are examples of things where the walk dimension usually exceeds two. Um, but these require a third thing 
uh, it's not just VD plus weak Poincaré, it's VD plus weak Poincaré plus a cutoff Sobolev inequality. And for those of you who don't know what cutoff Sobolev's inequality are, uh, I use them too, so I'll get to those in a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically like an inequality involving kind of like energy measures, if you've heard of those. Um, and they're often very hard to show. Um, but just a reminder, these are all for diffusions or nearest neighbor random walks on graphs. And we're interested in jump processes where the jumps are much bigger. So it's kind of a, like the heat kernel estimates will in turn be different. Um, but then in recent history, uh, I think that the two papers over which Chen Kumagai and Wang did this are still not actually published, but they're accepted. Um, uh, they might have actually been published since I last looked that up, but um, they weren't like a few months ago. Um, so Chen Kumagai and Wang show that under settings much like ours, MD mu is a metric measure space, XT is a symmetric jump processes, sorry, jump process. Uh, you have a regular Dirac Lay form E, and then you have the same basic assumptions we talked about, separable, locally compact, non-negative rate on measure, full support, infinite measure for the whole space. Um, and it's a pure jump regular Dirac Lay form. So Dirac Lay forms have like a strongly local component, a pure jump component and a killing component but we only talk about jumps, so that's why this is a jump process. Um, and then, so if you assume those basic assumptions and you assume the two volume growth properties that we described, volume doubling and reverse volume doubling, so volume doesn't grow too fast and volume doesn't grow too slow, um, then HK phi and PHI phi are both stable under bounded perturbations of the jumping measure, AKA what we want to show. But the only issue um, is that RVD is a little more restrictive than some of the things we uh, want to consider. So the problem is that if the metric measure space has any atoms, and by atom, I mean like a point with positive mass, um, then it's impossible for RVD to hold. And this is a very easy statement to show. Um, like if you have a constant C for which RVD holds, then you can just like consider smaller and smaller balls and the like the volume has to shrink a certain amount each time. Um, and when you take the limit, you get that this point has to have measure zero. And that, and that argument can be applied to any point. So it's impossible for there to be any atoms. Um, so I guess we've shown by contrapositive, we showed like if, the, if RVD holds, then there are no atoms. But this in turn means that if there are any atoms, RVD does not hold. So graphs are an example of a metric measure space with atoms. And we want to apply our results to graphs. So uh, the stuff that is done in this paper is basically showing that the results of Chen Kumagai and Wang can be extended to graphs. And this is very much like standing on the shoulders of giants, I guess, by like, I don't do a lot of like original arguments that would have worked from scratch. It's mostly just showing that like, if you modify things uh, to a certain like different space, the Chen Kumagai and Wang results and like, and, and then apply the Chen Kumagai Wang results to that, you, um, you get, you can extend them to graphs. And, other things with atoms. Um, yeah, in particular, the results of Chen Kumagai and Wang do not apply to graphs. Um, so yeah, so we're trying to generalize them to a wider class of metric measure spaces. Um, and in this talk, I'll only really talk about the arguments done for HK phi. The ones for PHI phi are kind of like, the, it's all the same type of stuff, but there's like a lot more things that need to be done and more conditions that need to be defined and it kind of wouldn't translate well to an hour long talk. Um, but yeah, so there's a few more conditions that we'll need for HK phi, but nowhere near the amount we would need for PHI phi. So um, yeah, over the next bit of time, I'll explain how to do the HK phi stability result. Um, but just to sum up, we're just trying to show that HK phi doesn't change whether it's true or false if the jump kernel is modified by some multiplicatively comparable thing. Okay, so first let's define escape times. So, um, let tau of any like open set be the time that that set is first escaped. So the smallest time at which our process is no longer in U. And then um, let's also define B of XR to just mean the ball of center X and radius R. So the volume thing that I forgot to define earlier was VXR is the measure of VXR, right? Mu of VXR. Okay. Um, and then, so we're defining another condition here. We say that condition E phi holds if there exists constants uh, C and C both positive, such that um, the escape time, if you start from X of B of XR is multiplicatively comparable to phi of R. 
So in our motivating example, um, we would say that like the escape time of uh, like the time that it takes you on that jump process on the real line of integers um, has, is proportional to R. Like the time to escape the ball of radius R is proportional to R. Um, and then as we did with JP, uh, we let uh, the upper and lower bounds be denoted by E phi greater than or less than and E phi greater than. Um, yeah, but this basically says escape time is proportional to R. Um, so here we have to define the carré du champ operator. This is for the purpose of defining cutoff Sobolev inequalities, those things mentioned earlier. Um, but another term for carré du champ operator is energy measure, basically given two functions f and g. Um, we define a uh, like measure based on those, which is given by this integral, where you look at like the differences of f and differences of y and integrate that with respect to your jumping measure. Um, and sometimes we'll only include one function here and it just means like gamma of f comma f. Um, so also um, uh, like if you have a, an open set A and a bigger open set B, um, you can talk about the like a cutoff function, which basically means something that's one inside the small open set, zero outside the big open set and uh, between zero and one in between. Um, and it belongs to your, um, to like the domain of the Dirichlet form. Yeah. Um, and I think I forgot to mention this earlier, but F here is the domain of the Dirichlet form. So um, the Dirichlet form isn't defined on like every function from M cross from M, um, but like it has a domain. Um, and like, it's kind of technical dealing with uh, like what is and isn't in the domain and a lot of the construction, which is kind of going to be hidden under the rug of this, was like um, constructing a domain of a Dirichlet form, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, but okay, so we define the Carré Duchamp operator, and we, aka energy measure, and we defined what it means to be a cutoff function. So given that, our cutoff Sobolev inequality, uh, CSJ, is that um, basically um, you have some constant C0, C1, and C2 such that for all uh, big radius and small radius, uh, big R and little r, and for almost all uh, x naught in the um, underlying set of our met metric measure space, and for all f in f, there exists a phi that's a cutoff function of this ball here with radius r, and this ball here of radius r plus r, such that this complicated-ish inequality holds where here you integrate f squared with respect to the energy measure, here you integrate it with respect to the regular measure. Um, and here you kind of just do like a uh, like cross term of like the differences of F with respect to the jumping measure. Um, the, the exact nature of what this means, I think like, I don't myself fully understand like how someone originally came up with cutoff sub 11 inequalities. Um, but basically it's like, it's a powerful thing for these things because of like results like those ones of, um, Barlow and others that like showed that um, when the walk dimension exceeded two, uh, you could add a cutoff sub 11 inequality to your stable characterization of uh, the parabolic Karnak inequality and stuff. Um, so like uh, basically the point of this is that it allows us to consider phi of R not to just be like R squared or something. It can be like R cubed or R to like log five of two or something, or log two of log base two of five. Um, but the exact nature, the exact like statement of this, like I wouldn't like dwell on remembering it. Um, and then, so that was CSJ, but we also have SCSJ, which is defined similarly, but instead now it has to be the same cutoff function for all F, whereas here the cutoff function was allowed to depend on the function F. Um, so SCSJ is basically a stronger version of it where it's like uniform in the function F. Um, but once again, don't dwell on the exact uh, nature of the statement because it's complicated. Um, so the exact uh, stable characterization of HK phi that Chen Kumagai and Wang proved um, was that if you have our basic assumptions and our volume growth assumptions VD and RVD, then the following are equivalent. Key kernel estimates, J phi plus that escape times thing, J phi plus the first cutoff sub 11 inequality, and J phi plus the stronger cutoff sub 11 equality. And both of these last two are stable. 
So um, if you look at the definition of these, uh, uh, it, I guess it's not quite obvious to see that, but if you think about it, uh, this will still be true if you replace J D X C Y with some multiplicatively comparable thing, like it won't change whether this inequality is true or false. Um, so these things are both stable, which means that HK phi is stable, assuming you have these assumptions. Um, we're gonna prove a very similar thing, except um, we obviously can't use RVD because RVD doesn't hold on metric measure spaces with atoms. And we want our results to apply to metric spaces, metric measure spaces with atoms. And also E phi, uh, it turns out, doesn't hold if there's atoms. So we'll have to replace both RVD and E phi with weaker versions. So the assumptions become slightly weaker and the conclusions become, or like one of the conclusions becomes slightly weaker, but it turns out we can still get um, an expression like this to work. Um, so now let me just give an overview of the solution to this uh, conundrum. So first we define a new condition like quasi RVD, which I'll just call QRVD, which basically is the same statement as RVD, except we don't require it to hold at small scales. Because remember that um, like small scales were, if you remember the proof of why RVD couldn't hold when there are atoms, it was basically because at small scales, if you took it like as the radius approaches zero, you would get um, the mass approaching zero. Um, but if we just like ignore the requirement that it hold at small scales, we can still get like, um, we can maybe still get a useful statement that we can use. Um, so after we've defined this QRVD thing, and I'll give you the exact definition of it later, but I'm just gonna give an overview of everything first. Then we construct a new metric measure space um, where instead of M, you basically replace every atom with a like tree-like thing where every element of the new space is a path down to the bottom in one of these trees. So here, like this is one element of M, but this like this is one element of M hat and this is another element of M hat, like that. Um, but all of the non, oops, but all of the non atoms just stay as they are um, in M hat. So if the, this M has only atoms, I guess, but like uh, I'll show later some examples where it has like both atoms and non-atoms. And then M hat just keeps the non-atoms the way they are and replaces the atoms with these kind of trees. Um, and we also um, come up with an auxiliary uh, Dirichlet form slash jump process associated with it, um, uh, which uh, like we are gonna later apply all these results to the, because the auxiliary space can have RVD because it doesn't have any atoms is the point. Um, but basically like, from this point on, we have to consider distinguishing between the original space and the auxiliary space. So we have two different spaces that we're applying these things to. Um, so then we show that if M, our original space, satisfies the basic assumptions and the volume growth assumptions with VD and QRVD instead of RVD, because it's impossible for it to satisfy RVD, then the auxiliary space satisfies the basic assumptions VD and RVD. And therefore, the results of Chen Kumagai and Wang can be applied to the auxiliary space. And then we just come up with a litany of results of the form. If some condition holds on the original space, it also applies on the auxiliary space. Or if some condition applies on the auxiliary space, it applies on the original space so that we can go back and forth with like um, those sorts of things until we get a stable characterization of HK phi heat kernel estimates on the original space. Um, yeah. So first let's define uh, QRVD. So this notation is going to be used a lot for all uh, atoms x, basically. Let dx be the smallest distance of some other point. Um, I guess it can, like, the definition will still hold for non atoms, but if there's like infinitely many points that come close to it, then this thing will have um, dx will be zero. But yeah, so like if you have some point x here and the closest other point is y at distance one, and then there's like a bunch of other points farther away, then dx will be one. Or, yeah. Um, so remember that this is the definition of RVD. It's basically that if you uh, multiply the radius of a ball by a factor of L, then the volume is at least multiplied by a factor of C, which is greater than one. So the definition of QRVD is identical, but we only require this when R is at least DX. So if there exists an L and a C such that this inequality holds for all X and M and for all positive R, that's at least DX. Um, so 
we literally just don't require it for the small scales that we're causing our problems. Um, so uh, let's like convince ourselves that this is actually like a strong, like a useful thing. Um, like that there are like a wide class of things that satisfy QRVD but not RVD by just considering some examples. So if you consider the integers, in this case Z1, but ZD for any D works, um, with Euclidean metric and counting measure, sorry, um, then uh, like this thing will not satisfy RVD because it has atoms, right? Um, but this thing will satisfy QRVD because um, like if you have if you have some ball that like already is at a big enough radius and you increase the radius, then it does have like these more things kind of similar to how like RD would. Um, another example is the Sierpinski graph. So a fractal graph um, with like the regular graph distance and counting measure that'll also, and I think there are some other distances one could use that would still work, but so this would also satisfy QRVD, but not RVD. Um, or you could also have some weird things like this. So this is basically all of R, like the real line, like, and with like real numbers, not integers, except for the interval from negative one to one has been replaced with a big fat atom here at zero, which has mass two and everything else has the Euclidean mass and everything has the regular Euclidean metric. So this thing also satisfies QRVD, but not RVD. Um, Cause if you take some X and consider like, so if X is here, you can consider any small amount of R and you'll get the volume growth you want. But if X is this, then it, we only require it for R bigger than this. So these are all like all three of these things are examples of like uh, metric measure spaces that uh, the results that I come up with work on, but the Chen Puma guy and Wang ones um, are not quite like handled by um, or yeah. So um, in addition to coming up with QRVD, we also have to come up with QE fee, like a thing that simplifies it, that relaxes it for small radii um, for the same reason. Basically E fee will fail at small scales because like you'll, it'll take a while to leave like an atom. Um, but we do the exact same thing. The only change is that it's all positive R greater than BX now. Um, so then now let's construct the auxiliary space. So the underlying set for it comes from, um, so first just consider the set of infinite binary trees. I'm gonna call that W. So one element of W is this blue path and like uh, any other path would be another element of this. So basically what we do is we replace every atom with a copy of W. Um, and then uh, we have to be a little precise about what metric we put on the internally on that, but we'll do that in a second. So let, yeah, let W be the set of infinite binary strings. Um, so it is easy to show that uh, if you assume the basic assumptions in QRVD, then everything is either an isolated atom or it's neither isolated nor an atom. So either like mu of x is positive and d of x is positive or mu of x is zero and d of x is zero. So everything that's an atom is like far, is like far away from everything else and everything that's not an atom can be approximated infinitely well by other things in your original space. So I'm just gonna call these MA and MC, these sets. That's, so we decompose M into MA and MC. Um, so we define M hat, the auxiliary space's underlying set by replacing every atom with a copy of itself times W um, and keeping every non-atom the way it is. So let's do some examples. So if M was that weird thing where we take the uh, like point zero to have measure two and everything else to be like, and we cut out the interval from negative one to one and keep everything else uh, the way it was in the real line. Then we keep everything like this here, but we, that one atom gets replaced by a copy of W. So like this blue line is an element of the auxiliary space, but also this little point, like let's call that two or something is an element of the auxiliary space um, just as well. Um, the other example, if our if our original space was Z1, then everything would be a copy of W because everything is an atom here. And this blue path would be an element of the auxiliary space. Um, so uh, once again, I feel like this is a good time to stop for if there's any clarifying questions that need to be asked. Does everyone kind of see like what I'm doing so far? <laughs> 
and like why and see why this is constructing a space where RVD is possible to hold now? So I missed something before. Uh, are you assuming a uniform upper bound on DX? Uh, we don't assume anything like that. I don't think we need to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are you are you asking about like when I did QRVD and QE fee, like when I defined those or? Yeah. So okay. DX, DX doesn't need to be bounded from above by some constant. No. Um, we like all the only thing that changes is that um, so whatever dx is we don't require this this inequality to hold if r is less than dx. Okay. Yeah. Um, like if it was a different x that was being considered, then like it would be a different dx that you cut it off at. But yeah. Um, cool. So that's so these are some examples of how to go from the auxiliary the original space to the auxiliary space. You basically replace every atom with a tree-like structure and keep all the non-atoms the way they are. Okay, so um, let's also, now that we've done that, let's let pi be the regular, the, the natural projection from the auxiliary space to the original space. So for example, like pi of this blue path would be, I guess, like this guy here. Um, whereas pi of like this path here would be this guy. Like it tells you which atom you're on basically. And if you're not at an atom, it tells you like where you are. Um, cool. So now we endow, uh, so, so we've come up with a space for the auxiliary space, but now we need to also come up with the metric um, and the measure. So let's use the metric uh, where like if Z and Z prime are elements of the auxiliary space, if they belong to separate atoms or non-atoms, then it's just the regular distance. Um, but if they're on the same atom, and they're like uh, they're like x w and x w prime. Then we define it this way with this kind of complicated thing that was kind of reverse engineered for what it had to be to make volume doubling and stuff work out. But it's basically phi inverse of phi dx over two to the m. Um, so dx is like the d of that atom, and m is like uh, how far like how far apart along the tree. W and W prime are. So like if they're very far apart on the tree, M is small. Um, and then it comes up with this measure, which bas is basically uniform on every atom and everything else is preserved. So like, um, like if you have some original set in the original space, the measure of pi inverse of that will be the same thing. Um, except you just divide, like if you have an atom that had mass like two, you divide that mass of two uniformly amongst the tree-like structure. Um, okay, and so we've defined the uh, auxiliary metric space. Now we just need to define the auxiliary jump process. And sorry again if it's not clear like why we're defining all these things. A lot of them are just kind of like what it had to be after a lot of trial and error to make uh, things come out the right way. Um, yeah. Um, so we basically the best way to describe what I want this auxiliary jump process to do is it um, as long as the original process stays on an atom it just jumps around the tree of that atom. And other than that, it jumps with the original process. So if the original process jumps from X to Y, this jumps to a random point on the tree, like rooted at Y. Uh, and like as the, and then if the original process stays on Y, this thing jumps around on the, um, on the uh, auxiliary tree thing rooted at Y. Um, and basically this is chosen again, kind of like, uh, so that we have J phi for the original space is equivalent to J phi for the auxiliary space. Um, yeah. So then we let uh, E hat be the Dirichlet form corresponding to this jump kernel. This is kind of technical stuff uh, that like encodes what this jump process does. Uh, let X hat T be the new jump process and note that uh, pi of X hat T, so like what atom are you on? That process follows the same law as the original jump process. And that'll be used many times throughout the uh, remaining stuff. Um, cool. So if M satisfies uh, the basic assumptions and VD and RVD, so all of the hypotheses that we want to have, um, and the results of uh, Chen, or oh, so then we can conclude that the results of Chen Kumagai and Wang apply to the 
auxiliary space. So basic assumptions for original imply basic assumptions for auxiliary. VD for M implies VD for M hat. Uh, QRVD for the original space implies RVD for the auxiliary space. And this is the crucial thing that was why the auxiliary space was necessary because we go from QRVD to the stronger RVD by eliminating the atoms basically. Um, so now we're ready to state our stable characterization of HK phi. And it's basically the same assumptions as always, basic assumptions, VD, and now QRVD instead of RVD. So I guess I lied when I said same as always, we've slightly weakened it. So it allows for things like those weird examples I drew. Um, then the following are equivalent, HK phi, J phi plus CSJ phi, J phi plus SCSJ, and now J phi plus QE phi. So this is exactly the same as the Chen Kumagai and Wang stability result, except this is QRVD and this is QE phi, uh, as promised. So here's a diagram of what our proof looks like. It makes extensive use of the auxiliary space. Um, basically, like the only things that are used are kind of results of the form, like if something holds on one space, it forms on the other and results that were already shown by Chen Kumagai and Wang. So they show that HK implies JP plus SCSJ, which obviously implies JP plus CSJ because SCSJ is by definition stronger. Um, and then we show that JP plus CSJ on the original space implies JP plus CSJ on the auxiliary space. Um, and then we also show that JP plus QE phi is equivalent to JP plus E phi on the auxiliary space. And then these are all equivalent by the main result of Chen Kumagai and Wang. And then we just need uh, HK phi on auxiliary implies HK phi on original. So that one goes backwards. Um, so these are kind of the implications we need to get this to work. And each one is kind of like a section of the paper, but let's just uh, restate what they are and go into like a bit of minor detail about what happens with them. So these are the following implications we use. These are the red arrows here. We use that J phi for one process or for one uh, like uh, metric measure Dirichlet space implies J phi for the other. We use that QE for original implies E like without the Q for the auxiliary. Um, oh, sorry, did someone have a question? It sounded like someone turned their volume on. Never mind. Sorry, um, so the red arrows were on the previous slide. The what? Yeah, these red arrows. Sorry. So. Right. So we need okay. J phi to go in both directions. We need CSJ to go forwards and we need HK to go backwards. Um, yeah, uh, would, it, would it help if I just like pause at this slide for a bit? Um, I'm happy to do that. Okay, cool. So yeah, so J phi in both directions, QE phi goes to E, but that goes backwards too. Then we need CSJ to go like original implies auxiliary. And then we need HK to be the other direction. Like if it holds for the auxiliary, it holds for the original. Um, so yeah, so like two and three here, the J phi one and the uh, escape times one, those both kind of follow from the definition of, oh no, sorry, only the J phi one follows from how we define the auxiliary space jump kernel. Because um, remember, I said on one of those slides, like the definition of J hat of Z, Z prime was basically reverse engineered so that we would get this to work. So that's that's where that comes in. Then the escape times one follows from the fact that like pi of the auxiliary process has follows the same law as a process as the original process does. So the escape times are going to be the same for large enough times or for large enough R, sorry. Um, and then these last two are kind of more complicated and each one is a separate section of the paper. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that's kind of like what, uh, like basically that shows what like we've reduced it all down to now. And it's just kind of like each one is kind of a technical slog from here. Um, so uh, I won't do like go into that much detail about what happens for the PHI one and like what arguments we need and what implications of like original to auxiliary and vice versa, but I'll just state what the result was. So assuming we have the basic assumptions, the volume doubling and quasi reverse volume doubling. So weaker than Chen Kumagai and Wang assumed. Then the following are equivalent, the parabolic Karnak inequality, uh, PHI plus, which is a stronger version of the parabolic Karnak inequality 
which is basically just more restrictive of what the constants can be. Um, and then the upper heat kernel bound. So this is only the upper bound of HK phi. This could have been written as HK of phi comma less than or equal to if we had been consistent with naming practices plus a near diagonal lower bound on the heat kernel, which I won't define here. Um, and then this is kind of like the averages of the jump kernel behave well. Uh, so UJS implies, uh, assumes that the jump kernel exists and says that its averages behave well kind of. Um, and that's equivalent to this thing without UHK. And that's equivalent to some uh, Poincare inequality plus upper bound of J phi um, plus cutoff Sobolev plus the same UJS thing. And this one is the stable guy. Uh, out of all these things, this is the only one that's obviously stable from the definitions. So we do indeed show that PHI is stable. Um, and these are kind of like all, all almost to a T the same uh, characterization of uh, parabolic chronic inequality that Chen Puma guy and Wang came up with. They also had some other ones that involved escape times and like elliptic holder regularity and parabolic holder regularity. But those ones like wouldn't be true anymore because we would lose them for the same reason we lost things like RVD. So I didn't include them in that. Um, so then this is all well and good, but QRVD is a very abstract thing. So let's try to show now why this is useful to us in the context of graphs. Because remember from the beginning, from the onset, what we wanted was to apply Chen Puma Guy and Wang results to graphs. So um, now we finally get to the uniform perfectness thing that I promised early on. So a metric measure space is called uniformly perfect if there exists some constant C such that basically a bigger ball is always bigger than the smaller ball uh, if the ratio between the radii is C. Um, so like if you take a ball and expand the radius by C, you always at least gain some point. That means uniformly perfect. Um, so uh, as we are very much in the habit of doing now, we define it to be quasi uniformly perfect if this holds for all balls that are big enough that we don't like run into like both this ball and this ball being less than being just like singletons. Um, so we basically only require this to hold if R is greater than DX. Um, and we call that quasi uniformly perfect. So a graph is obviously not going to be uniformly perfect because if like uh, if like DX for some point X is one, then like you could have like the ball of radius one and the ball of radius one, one millionth. And that would violate this thing because they would be the same, like the this annulus would not be non-empty. Um, but if we uh, just don't, if we just relax the requirements to allow for atoms to just do what they want to do and then require this for every bigger ball, then we get a new condition called quasi-uniform perfectness. And then we show a lemma that if we have a quasi-uniformly perfect thing and mu is a radon measure on all that with like all those assumptions, then VD implies QRVD. So if this was just regular uniform perfectness, we would have VD implies RVD. That's kind of a well-known standard result. Um, but we show that the same thing happens when we um, have quasi-uniformly perfectness and relax our conclusion to QRVD. So another lemma. Um, if we suppose that M is the vertex set of a connected undirected graph with infinite diameter, and D is the graph metric, um, and to be precise here, this means that like the distances are all positive integers, right? Like there's distances of one, distances of two, like the, the edges of the graph don't have like separate lengths, they're all length one. Then MD is quasi-uniformly perfect. So if we know that it's quasi-uniformly perfect and we know that it has VD from this lemma, then we know that it has QRVD. So basically graphs that follow VD um, satisfy all of our assumptions. Um, yeah. Um, and this result is actually pretty easy to show because you can just take the annulus of, you can just take the big C here in the definition to be two. And you get that the ball of radius two R minus the ball of radius R has to be non-empty because there has to be an integer between uh, R and two R, right? Because if R is bigger than one, um, yeah. And like the graph has infinite diameter assumption comes into play here, but yeah. So a corollary of all this is that if G um, is a connected, undirected, countable graph of infinite diameter, and little d is the graph metric of G, 
and mu is a positive radon measure that satisfies all of the assumptions we've been carrying out. So full support, um, I guess, yeah, that's obvious. And mu of m equals infinity. Um, and E is a pure jump. So you have a pure jump process on it. Um, and then if you just have VD, so we don't even need QRVD anymore. So this result can be stated all in terms of like things that I didn't define in this paper uh, and phi is a function of regular growth. Then we have this characterization of heat kernel estimates, which is like the same one as before. HK is equivalent to J plus escape times is equivalent to J plus each cutoff sub 11 inequality. And we have the same characterization of uh, parabolic Karnak. Um, so yeah, that kind of sums it up. Um, one minor thing is that it's kind of annoying that we had to assume that this was a continuous time process because on graphs, it might be more natural to think of a discrete time Markov chain. Um, but so I haven't done this yet, but like the process of constructing an auxiliary space might be helpful in this because um, you could just have it be like a discrete time thing that just like jumps to some like thing like our auxiliary space where there's like a bunch of trees and that will allow you to assume RVD which might be helpful, might not. Um, but otherwise, um, like I'm also trying to just do it, do the, like come up with just like uh, raw heat kernel type arguments to show that like if the continuous time heat kernel estimates hold some discrete version of that holds. Um, so that is to be seen, I guess, but yeah. Um, that kind of sums everything up. So I guess, are there questions? Sorry if I went over. Is it? Oh, 358, cool. Uh, are there any like slides people would like me to go back to or anything or just things to clarify? Um, well, I guess I have a question. Uh, so does it make sense to look at uh, elliptic Arnak inequalities in this context? Um, yeah, like a lot of things, um, like a lot of Chen Kumagai and Wang type papers like do talk about, like there's another one for stability of elliptic, elliptic Arnak inequality, I think too. Um, I don't know if that was actually Chen Kumagai and Wang, that might've been Matav actually. Wait, Matav, you're here, right? Do you remember when that was shown? So, so uh, actually we, you know, in my work with Martin Barlow, we showed that elliptic Arnak inequality is stable, but that's only for diffusions. Oh, we, okay. We still do not know if elliptic Hanak inequality is stable for uh, jump processes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but it, but the elliptic Hanak inequality is for sure like one of the relevant kind of like inequalities that exist in this area that like people study. Yeah, I, I mostly asked that because of the, the work of uh, Martin and Matab. Okay, yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but meant to like Matav helped a lot with like all the arguments that were in this kind of, um, cause it was my master's essay under him. So yeah. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions, then uh, we can all unmute ourselves and thank Jens. Thank you, Jens. Cool, yeah, thanks everyone. That was fun. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was a. That was all very nice. Cool. Yeah. So is this uh, all completely written? Or? Um, it is written and submitted, but I'm also trying to do the like discrete time version of it now, which might be like added later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's still in like phase one of the uh, EJP review process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Jonathan asked, is it wrong to pronounce <laughs> my name with a Y instead of a J? It's right to pronounce my name with a Y instead of a J. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I don't think I notice when people do a J because a lot of people do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so maybe we can stop the recording. <laughs>